tonight, for the first time, the full story of Britain's biggest ever child sex abuse scandal. A major investigation has revealed devastating evidence that for 30 years, hundreds of the most vulnerable children in society were persistently abused by paedophiles employed inside the residential care system. Twenty years ago, a young boy from Cheshire made a journey he'd never forget. He was removed from familiar surroundings and taken into care. He committed no crime. His parents had separated. His mother couldn't cope. As he began his time in care, he'd meet others. Some were petty criminals, but most came from broken homes, just like him. His new home would now be a residential school in the Cheshire town of Widnes. I'd been there six days, um, six or seven days, and I was actually top from the dormitory. We sit in the dormitory and you have lights on till 10 o'clock normally. I was actually took just after 10 o'clock, the lights had just gone out, um, and I was actually took downstairs in my pyjamas to his office. Alan Andrews was 14 when he was placed at St Aidan's. It was run by Catholic Social Services, part of the Archdiocese of Liverpool. The man who'd taken him to his office after lights out was the school's headmaster, Terence Hoskin. I was caned on my bare backside. He struck me twice and told me to go back up to my dormitory. Shortly after that, um, he started he started caning, but he, he used um, the tip of the cane to touch private parts. Through a couple of months, it was actually um, inserting the cane. Um, and then what happened? He did. Um, the first occasion, um, he actually stuck his um, penis in in me in me in me back passage, but that score was. Uh, tensed up really and he stopped. What about afterwards? I mean he didn't do it, he didn't do that again for for about three months, it was three months after the first occasion um, he just came in, touched my private parts with the cane. But then eventually what happened? He didn't actually insert his penis into my bum. It was 15 years before Alan Andrews told police what the headmaster of St Aidan's had done to him. His complaint was the first of many they were to hear. An investigation began into the abuse of children in residential institutions throughout the North West. It went back as far as the 1960s, the era of approved schools. Eight out of ten boys are sent to approved schools for stealing or breaking and entering. There are 90 schools for boys, three times as many as for girls. But no boy can be committed before he's ten years old, and no boy can be detained for more than three and a half years. Past child abuse investigations had usually relied on victims contacting police. In the North West inquiry, once a member of staff had been identified as a suspect, Police set out to find former residents who were at the home at the same time. We called the other day. You, you've heard about it, have you? The outcome, well, the outcome is, hopefully, is a prosecution. That proactive method started producing dramatic results. Soon, those traced by police were naming as abusers other childcare staff at other homes. 
By March 1995, two neighboring police forces, Cheshire and Merseyside, were working together. We never ever realized what we were going to uncover. We thought it was going to be an inquiry that was, you know, relatively short in the, in the length of time it would take. But once we actually started, and we realized the magnitude of it, and we decided very early on that we would interview wherever possible every single boy that an individual was likely to have abused whilst he was in, in the employment of the particular home. The records of 30 years of the care system were gathered at a secret and secure location. Social workers from Liverpool and Cheshire were brought in to investigate members of their own profession. We feel very strongly that we have got to make sure that everything that can possibly be done to set right the things that went wrong in the past has to be done. Whatever the cost of that and however embarrassing that might be, we have got to make sure that we've finally once and for all dealt with the, the, the skeletons in these cupboards. At St Aidan's in Witness, the care home run by the Catholic Church, the inquiry was finding out more about a 14-year-old boy. He'd made a complaint in 1980, after running away. There was a knock on the door, and then banging on the living room window. I opened the curtains, and it was James, and it was dressed there, crying, brought him in, and he wouldn't tell us what had happened, why he'd run away. We asked him how he got home, he said he'd hitched, hitched a ride. He says, I'm not going back to St. Aidan's. James Stewart was running away from Colin Dick, a military man who'd spent 14 years in the Royal Hussars. Colin Dick had worked as a junior civil servant in the Middle East before joining the staff at St. Aidan's in 1978. He wouldn't tell his dad or I, so we ended up phoning the police. And he told the police. And the policeman come back into the room and he said, it's horrendous what's happened to you, son. He said buggery were involved. He said, and he'd leave James at home with us. While police were conducting that investigation, the headmaster of St. Aidan's, Terence Hoskin, paid a visit to James's home. I said, well, he's not going back there. He'll go back there over my dead body, and he's not going anywhere near Colin Dick. He said he wouldn't, he wouldn't be put back in the same part of the school where Colin Dick was. He would be put in the other side of the school. Faced with the evidence of a runaway boy against the word of a respected member of staff, the police investigation got no further. Colin Dick continued to work at St. Aidan's. James was taken back. On her next visit, his mother was horrified to find that James was being held in the secure unit and still complaining about abuse. As a last resort, she and her family planned his escape. I told James that his gran was outside waiting in the car to pick him up. And once we got to that outer door, they did allow him to come to that outer door with the guard alongside him to see us off. And I said, once I get you there, I'm going to shove you and just run. And that's where I did. It worked. But they grabbed hold of me and pulled me back inside. James ran back to help and was caught. The police were called. I said, they're sexually abusing the children here and somebody's got to do something about it. And I said, I'm at my wit's end, I want my son out. I said, it's the only way I can do it. He said, you're going through the wrong channels. I said, well, you tell me the channels to go through and I'll do it. I've already tried it and nothing's been done. With that, we were showing out of the, the building then. What James's mother didn't know was that there'd been other complaints against Colin Dick. In 1981, he was dismissed for plying youngsters with alcohol. Then he stood trial for indecent assault on a St. Aidan's boy, but was acquitted. Two years later, he applied to work with children again. Terence Hoskin, his former headmaster, who'd known about the complaints, gave Colin Dick a glowing reference. His relationships with boys were always good. He spent a considerable amount of his own time ensuring that the individual needs of the children in the unit were catered for. I would consider Mr. Dick most suitable for consideration for the post for which he now applies. 
Colin Dick got the job and went back to work with children at a home run by Manchester City Council. James Stewart left St Aidan's. He became a persistent offender and spent years in jail. In 1989, at the age of 22, he hung himself in a prison cell. Six years later, the Northwest Inquiry caught up with Colin Dick. He pleaded guilty to abusing six boys at St. Aidan's. He was jailed for four years. His former boss, Terence Hoskin, became an authority in childcare. In 1980, he was president of the National Association of Community Homes. When he was arrested 13 years later, he was the head of a group of privately run special schools. A married man with children of his own, Hoskin was convicted of sexual or physical assaults against 11 boys at St. Aidan's. The man the prosecution described as a predatory punisher was jailed for eight years. The, the staff in the homes um, had very, very considerable direct individual power over the children there. Power to reward, power to punish, power to decide how long they stayed whether they went home and all those kinds of things. And those establishments also had the power to keep the rest of the world at bay, to keep the rest of the world away. There was no real rigorous inspection of them or monitoring of them. The North West Inquiry was finding allegations of abuse at six major care establishments in Cheshire and Merseyside. One was on the coast near Liverpool. It was run by the same Catholic charity that owned St Aidan's in Widnes. St Vincent's at Formby, now closed, was a long way from home for a ten-year-old boy from Manchester. It was to cry myself to sleep because I was afraid from being away from my parents. Um, one house in my store, Mr Stanton, he was like friendly towards me. Edward Stanton was a former storeman and lab technician who in the 70s came into childcare after being a youth club volunteer. At St Vincent's he soon found himself in charge of 15 boys in one of the dormitories. Next thing he started touching me. Um, he uh, made me touch him, which I thought was odd at first, but I didn't I didn't really know, I thought it was, I don't know, it never happened at home. I weren't the only boy in, in the room, it would be like three or four boys, and he used to lie in bed thinking, please go to the other boy. I know it's sad to say, do it to someone else, but and when it weren't my turn, I was relieved. I just woke up, and like, he was close down his head, and he stunk abuse and you know he starts to masturbate me in the bed and I just got flame from that. Went on quite often, you know, like it do say twice a week or like three times, four times a week, just depends, you know, when, when he was on nights. Sometimes he used to volunteer, you know, to do it like and um it just went on for about well, on and off for about three years. Other boys were subjected to sexual assaults at the beach close to St Vincent's and on school trips. Ken Williams started absconding from school to get away from Edward Stanton. Being driven back to St Vincent's, he jumped from a moving car. Later, he cut his wrists. He was becoming desperate. Do you used to have a geese pen at the back of the school. Round this pen was a metal, f a metal fence, a spiked metal fence. Um, one night I refused to come in and they chased me. So I went up on this geese pen saying, look, if you come near me, I'm going to throw myself off onto these spikes. They came near me, sort of threw myself off. Uh, Luckily enough, 
the spikes didn't go through me. They went through the bottom of my jeans and my leg twisted round and snapped. So that was a relief to know that I'd be going to hospital and hopefully stay in hospital for a while and you won't be able to get near me. But that weren't the case. They just put my leg in plaster and sent me straight back. Came back from hospital. Obviously, my plaster was still wet. But the next night, he came into my room, done the same thing. Woke up, I was on my belly, and he was raping me. I was asleep. I woke up with him on top of me. There was nothing I could do. Nothing whatsoever. Eventually, one of the boys complained about Stanton to a member of staff at St Vincent's. He was taken to see the deputy head. I told him um, that Mr Stanton was touching me up during the night. He's coming in drunk, stinking the booze, you know, doing this, that and the other. And um, I think at the time, you know, he didn't believe me. I was only like a young kid, always in trouble. But like, when I told him, you know, I was really telling him the truth. But he, none of them wanted me. Do you have any idea why they didn't want to believe you? I was just a young kid. I was in trouble. Yet again, a complaint from a child, which later turned out to be true, got nowhere. Stanton was free to continue his abuse of children. When we look back on many of the complaints there were, many of the times when people could have suspected that something was going wrong, is that constantly the perpetrators are saying, I don't trust this boy. He's got a vested interest in telling lies. He wants to be moved somewhere else that he thinks is nicer. Um, he wants to cause trouble. He's got a criminal record as long as your arm, so on and so on. If there was ever any doubt about what Edward Stanton was doing, it was dispelled in 1994. After his arrest, he confessed that he was a paedophile. He was working in a children's home in Strathclyde. Stanton pleaded guilty to specimen charges involving seven boys at St Vincent's. A further 18 boys accused him of serious sexual offences. He was jailed for 13 years. Some of those who've been in care have gone on to spend time in prison, which is where police investigating abuse had to go to find them. Their word was more difficult to believe, but many of their accounts stood up to scrutiny. I just burst out crying. And they said, well, can you tell me about it? I says, yeah. And they asked me, was it male or female who was abusing me? I told them it was a, a male. And they asked me, did I know his name? I said, yeah, his name's Savage. Uh, then they asked me to describe him. I described him. Uh, and then they showed me a photograph. Is that him? I said, yeah, that's him straight away. Philip Savage was a childcare worker with Liverpool City Council. The prisoner went on to describe what Savage had done to him when he was in care at the age of seven. I was in bed, just like trying to go to sleep. He came in and started doing all them things to me all over again, putting his hand in my bed clothes inside my jammers, playing with my penis, got me out of bed made, forced his penis into my mouth and basically he buggered me and I, he just told me not to tell anybody I wouldn't be believed in this, that and the other Philip Savage was put on trial last year as he walked into court the prisoner was brought from jail to be a witness for the prosecution when I was in that courtroom I wasn't a 28 year old man I was a 7 year old lad inside the man's body when I was given evidence, you know, and it just brought all the memories all flooding back to me. So I mean, it was like watching a telly and seeing it all on a TV. And, you know, it was frightening because he was there and I was a child again. Philip Savage was found guilty of sexual offences against nine boys. He committed most of those offences at Liverpool's Dyson Hall Assessment Centre, where he assaulted boys detained in the cells of the secure unit. He was jailed for 15 years.
but his trial held a cruel twist for his victims. Back in 1974, at the age of 21, Savage had sought counselling. His medical records, which were shown to the court, included a letter of referral to a psychologist from the counselling service. Mr. Savage was extremely distressed about his physical attraction towards young men, and in particular boys between the age of 13 and 14. He has to date been able to control his feelings, but is afraid that he may eventually give in to them. His fears had been enough for him to give up voluntary youth work. The counselling service had a policy of alerting social services when children were in danger, but they say they have no record of their involvement with Savage and that it's not known what action was taken. Two years after seeking therapy for his attraction to young boys, he got a job as a residential care worker with Liverpool Social Services and sexually abused children for ten years. But his trial held a cruel twist for his victims. Back in 1974, at the age of 21, Savage had sought counselling. His medical records, which were shown to the court, included a letter of referral to a psychologist from the counselling service. Mr. Savage was extremely distressed about his physical attraction towards young men, and in particular boys between the age of 13 and 14. He has to date been able to control his feelings, but is afraid that he may eventually give in to them. His fears had been enough for him to give up voluntary youth work. The counselling service had a policy of alerting social services when children were in danger but they say they have no record of their involvement with Savage and that it's not known what action was taken. Two years after seeking therapy for his attraction to young boys, he got a job as a residential care worker with Liverpool Social Services and sexually abused children for ten years. It was worse for the boys and the children. They were there to look after. So in that, in that way, they betrayed just about everybody you can think of. The systematic failure was nowhere more evident than Greystone Heath School. Before it closed, it was home to more than a hundred boys at any one time, and harboured persistent abuses for twenty years. It was run by Liverpool City Council. Stephen Bennett was the youngest of five children. By the age of twelve, he'd been in trouble for stealing, and magistrates deemed him out of control. Stephen was sent to Greystone Heath in 1973. The secrets of his boyhood there remained hidden until now. Uh, this is fine. <laughs> Remember it? Yeah. It's still got the same smell. This is the home I was in when I was, you know, a, a, a little boy. This is the boot room. This is where you got your coats. And the names. Your names, your numbers. My name was on one of these at one time. At the time at Greystone Heath, a young care worker was starting what promised to be a brilliant career. He was Alan Langshaw. This, this is where the, the, I got abused him, by Mr Langshaw. The first abuse was when I was kept behind because Mr. Langshaw was my housemaster. He wrote a report on me. And you'd get upset. And when you were upset, that would be his particular moment to, to get you to sit on his knee to cuddle you, to say, you'll be all right, don't worry, I'll take care of you. And he'd stroke your leg like, and he slowly but surely he progressed. He kissed you down the side of the neck, and then he kissed your neck. Then he'd kiss you on the face, and one, then he'd one thing would lead to another, where he'd end up putting his hand into your pants, and um, he'd start fondling you, and then he'd guide your hand towards his. To, to, towards his trousers and basically get you to do exactly the same. By 1979, Alan Langshaw was in charge of a unit of his own. It was the assessment unit. He was responsible for new arrivals. 
It was one Christmas when the Lanchard took that picture. This is me in United shirt and my mate um, Lanchard bought these shirts as along with other things, trainers, footballs. He used to tell us all sorts of stories, you know, things like he used to play uh, rugby for England, stock car racing. He used to tell me things like his wife was in hospital with leukemia and he had a baby that lived for two weeks and died of leukemia. I mean, I know them all to be false now, but at the time he used to make himself up to be something he wasn't. I think he was just saying it to to win me sympathy. I think this was a way of control, controlling me. The main thing was fear. I feared him. And looking back, he, he played on that. Um, I ran away once after the, the initial abuse. And um, I've never had a beating so severe in all my life than, than I got off him. He ruled us, you know... He said when we went home and when we didn't go home. The two friends were sexually abused repeatedly by Langshaw. Such was their fear of him, they didn't even tell each other. This is my room. This used to be my room. Used to be a bed here. My bed was over there. There used to be three of us in this room. I was twelve, I was only twelve. I'm not going to get big. It should have been made, it should have been something we should have done, but it was fucking hard to do. Maybe if we'd have done something at that time, the other boys wouldn't have got it. Hands are them. Whilst Stephen Bennett was being abused by Alan Langshaw, the man responsible for his welfare was his house warden, Dennis Grain. Grain had been a painter and decorator before working with youngsters in care. He was a lifelong scoutmaster. He was 40 years old and married when he took charge of his own unit at Greystone Heath. Dennis Grain and company was like Butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. He was a loving, caring housemaster. He cared about his boys, his units, how it was clean, and it was just a front. It was a bad front, but he was, he was good at it. Grain's own living quarters were only a few steps from where the boys slept. Things change when you went to your dorm at night. And you'd be asleep and he'd, he'd wake up and there'd be a hand over your mouth. And Dennis Green's hand would be inside your pyjamas. I had to tell my mum. I told her I was being abused. It's been going on for two years and that's why... I was a little so-and-so, what she thought it was, for running away. Yeah, my mum was upset, and she bounced down to the police station with me, and we made a complaint to the police, and they kept me waiting for two hours. And in that time, they'd phoned Grace Dolneef, and they come back with the conclusion the words was a malicious liar, which never left me mind. The boy was moved to another home and heard nothing more about his complaint. Twenty years later, police arrested his former house warden. Dennis Grain decided that he was going to assist the inquiry with offences that he'd been involved in. And to that end, he wrote a list for officers uh, which showed that he had abused in four homes over 20 years. Grain listed victims at places run by Bernardo's and NCH Action for Children. He admitted abuse at a boys' hostel in Yorkshire. He named one of his victims as the boy at Greystone Heath previously branded a malicious liar. 
Dennis Grain was jailed for seven years. Others at Greystone Heath have gone on trial for sexual abuse. Roy Shuttleworth was jailed for ten years for offences between 1974 and 1986. He was a house warden in charge of a unit. Science teacher Keith Laverack was only last week sentenced to 18 years in prison. Most of his offences were at Greystone Heath in the 1960s. Other sex offenders had links to Greystone Heath. A member of staff in the 1970s was Stephen Norris, the care worker twice convicted for sexual abuse at children's homes in North Wales. In 1984, social worker Jack Bennett pleaded guilty to indecent assaults. He brought boys to the home and gave them bogus medicals. But Greystone Heath was just the beginning of Alan Langshaw's career. While his victims stayed silent, his reputation went from strength to strength. In 1982, he left to become the senior care officer at St Vincent's, the school run by the Catholic Social Services charity near Liverpool. Within three years, he was promoted to principal. But in 1986, two boys finally spoke out and accused Alan Langshaw of sexually abusing them. This time a complaint got as far as being considered for prosecution. In the end, the Director of Public Prosecutions found that the boy's evidence was insufficient to bring criminal proceedings. The case against Langshaw was dropped. The boys, however, needed help. Two boys referred to me, and the social workers who made the referrals told me they'd been sexually abused. Um, by a member of staff at uh, St Vincent's and I began seeing them for therapy and after a little while I discovered that Alan Langshaw had been reinstated and by this time I knew very well that they had indeed been sexually abused and that Alan Langshaw was the perpetrator so I was very worried about that and wrote to Liverpool Social Services saying that um, children were at risk from this man the council's replies to Mr. Glasgow stressed the matter had already been dealt with. An investigation has been made, both by police and members and officers of the city council. As a result of these inquiries, it was concluded that children were not at risk. I cannot see how this matter can be profitably pursued any further. At um, grassroots level, um, there was quite clearly a fairly widespread belief that this abuse had taken place. Um, but those staff were unable to take any action. Um, the level at which action ought to take place, a managerial level, um, basically they just dodged and weaved for 18 months. While David Glasgow remained convinced that Alan Langshaw was a child abuser, local MPs were starting to ask questions about the police inquiry. Merseyside's Chief Constable and the Director of Public Prosecutions insisted the criminal investigations had been thorough. Edwina Curry, the Minister responsible for the childcare system, was asked to intervene. She stood by Langshaw. Whilst it was recognised that Mr Glasgow's opinions were sincerely held, none of the investigations referred to produced any evidence to support his view that Mr Langshaw had been involved. It remains the firm view of his employers that he was innocent. Langshaw went on to spend another eight years working with children. At Halton College in Widnes, where he lectured about social work, Alan Langshaw wrote the complaints procedure on sexual abuse. If such complaints arose, he was designated to liaise with police. Then, in 1994, following another accusation of sexual abuse against him, the North West Inquiry applied its distinctive investigative approach to Alan Langshaw they found others he'd abused. We start here with one allegation by one man against a member of staff in, in one of the homes, in this case, Alan Langshaw. Three years later, after the, all the investigations and interviews have taken place, we, can, we see here that I think it's 57 different people make an allegation that Alan Langshaw sexually abused them. All these people in some way demeaned and uh, affected 
by the activities of that one man. In November 1994, Alan Langshaw pleaded guilty to 30 specimen charges of buggery, indecent assault and gross indecency. He confessed to abuse at Greystone Heath, St Vincent's and against teenagers with learning difficulties at Halton College in Witness. He was jailed for 10 years, having admitted abusing boys in his care for 22 years. Sometimes an organisation reacts to protect itself rather than um, the people it has responsibility for. And I think it's very easy to believe that people you know and trust um, couldn't possibly do something. And I think it's partly to do with that, um, that sex offenders are made out to be beasts and monsters when they look like you and me, and you can't tell the difference. For 30 years, paedophiles were drawn to jobs in care homes. They remained undetected for many reasons. They frightened children into silence. Those who spoke out were branded malicious liars. Vetting and monitoring procedures were inadequate. A childcare worker needed no qualifications, accepted low pay, but had ready access to vulnerable young children. So far in the northwest, 12 men who worked in care homes have been jailed. National youth and Christian organizations are now under investigation. My main focus is, can we be sure that it's not happening now? We can't undo history, we can't change it. We can. Uh, we can make sure that the truth comes out, which is some partial, some partial, I think, uh, uh, a reassurance to the people who were involved, uh, to the victims who were involved. Uh, but what we, our prime aim, of course, is to say, well, can we be quite sure that it's not, that the conditions don't exist, that that recipe can't be reinvented? Can you? For the future. Oh, I'm pretty sure about that. I'm pretty clear about that. That the, the conditions, the recipe that led to those problems now has been identified. We now know the cocktail that you must never mix. New laws and child protection procedures should mean that being in care is much safer for children in the 1990s. But it seems paedophiles remain within the system, having acquired professional respectability before the regulations were tightened. Five of those jailed in the Northwest were still working in child care when they were arrested. One, Keith Laverack, was convicted only last week. The Northwest investigation found he'd sexually abused boys at Greystone Heath in the 1960s. That led to the discovery in Cambridgeshire that he continued to abuse children in care for a further 17 years. I don't think the Northwest is a black spot at all. I would hate to say it, but I would suspect if you look around the country, during that period of time that we're looking about here, this type of event probably could and probably has happened in many other places, but so far there's been nothing to trigger the thoroughness of an investigation that we've undertaken. The Northwest Inquiry has tested the allegations made by individuals who say they were sexually abused in care. So far they've identified more than 800 potential victims. It's Britain's biggest ever child care scandal. Children who had no one else to turn to were betrayed by the system set up to look after them. And if there are 800 victims in the Northwest alone, how many are there in the rest of Britain? Nobody knows.